WCW World War 3 1997 took place on November 23rd in the Palace of Auburn Hills, Michigan. Around 17,000 fans attended the event and a reported 205,000 fans bought the show on pay-per-view, down significantly from Halloween Havoc. Our show's headlined by the World War 3 60-man battle royal and our semi-main event sees Ric Flair take on Kurt Hennig for the United States Championship. Let's get started with our opening match, the Faces of Fear vs Glacier and Ernest Miller. So, on Nitro, Glacier's been having a little trouble with Ming. Old Chili Chode was able to defeat the Barbarian on TV, but he hasn't had any luck at all against Ming. Both Glacier and Ernest Miller have felt what it's like to take the Tongan death grip, so they're out for a little revenge tonight at World War 3. All four men beat the hell out of each other at the opening bell and it settles down to Ming and Glacier. Glacier gets the better of Ming before tagging in Miller, and Glacier gives Miller a hand when Ming scoops the cat up for a slam. The Barbarian's no match for Miller's kicks, Glacier gets tagged back in and I've no idea how this little jump of his was supposed to hurt the Barbarian but the faces of fear stay in control when Ming gets back in the ring. And check out Ernest Miller using Ming as a springboard to the outside, gotta admit that was pretty good. It makes Glacier's plancha a afterwards look absolutely shit though. Glacier gets attacked by the Barbarian after Freezy Fuck gets distracted by Jimmy Hart and back in the ring, we see the Faces of Fear backdrop powerbomb combo, it's always good to see. The cat's talking a lot of nonsense to the referee and he falls out of the ring after Glacier bumps into him. And the crowd pops when Glacier gets his ass kicked in the corner, I pop too. There's a chin lock right there from the Barbarian, a shoulder breaker from the Minger. We see the deadly nerve pinch but Ming unfortunately misses an elbow drop. Glacier tries to tag out but he can't reach his partner. He's able to tag in the cat though after delivering a back suplex to Ming, but even after Miller fires up on both faces of fear, he's still not able to win the match. Cat lays in the kicks and it looks like he had things under control, but Jimmy Hart jumps on the apron to cause a distraction. Miller takes care of Jimmy, but he can't take care of that Tongan death grip from the man called Ming. The cat loses this one via pinfall, and I'd say World War 3 has already gotten off to a wonderful start. In all seriousness though, this was pretty much a Nitro match and it was nothing special. We really should have had the Ultimo Dragon vs Yuji Nagata match kick off the show. Next we've got a TV title match, Disco Inferno vs Perry Saturn. Disco lost the TV title to Saturn a few weeks back on Nitro so he's trying to get it back tonight at World War 3. Raven says let the stretching begin as Saturn hands the belt over to referee Mickey J and Disco gets embarrassed with a takedown and a slap to the face. This happens twice before Disco goes down after a shoulder block and already it looks like the challenger's no match for the champion. Disco fires back with a hip toss, a body slam and a big right hand and and Saturn's a little taken back by the Inferno's offense. He gets himself together, he gets in a cheap shot from the apron, but Disco puts Saturn down again with a hip toss and Perry gets out of the ring before it can happen again. After walking around the rings and wasting a ton of time, Disco forcefully brings Saturn back inside the ropes, but Perry makes Disco pay with a hard clothesline. Disco shows he ain't out of this one yet with an inverted atomic drop followed by a ton of corner strikes. We see a fist drop from the Inferno, he blocks a Saturn counter when the Inferno comes off the top rope, but a missed elbow drop leads to Perry performing a pump handle suplex. Still, Saturn's corner springboard moonsault misses its target, leading to Disco hitting a clothesline of his own. After trading pin attempts, Disco gets his little disco ball smashed on the top rope and Saturn performs a diving clothesline that takes both guys to the outside. Smackhead Kidman then talks shit to Disco from behind the guardrail, so Disco throws him over and Kidman takes a chart buster. Some new member of Raven's flock takes the move too, and this is Lodi. Lodi was not introduced to fans on Nitro. Van Hammer isn't so easy to take out though, and Saturn takes advantage of this rather big distraction, but back in the ring, Disco performs a swinging neckbreaker. Disco then hits a top rope crossbody, but Saturn rolls through. We see the rings of Saturn, and Disco gives up. Not an awful match here at all, and it was a valiant effort from the challenger. It's not a match I'd recommend either, but it was still watchable. Not bad at all. 
The Giant got his hand injured on Nitro by Scott Hall, but the big man isn't going to let the injury stop him from winning World War 3 tonight. The Giant says this is his spot, this is his destiny. Someone's going to pay for the injury tonight in the Battle Royal, and Mean Gene says he wouldn't like to be in Scott Hall's shoes tonight in the main event. Back in the arena, we have Ultimo Dragon vs Yuji Nagata. If Dragon wins, he gets 5 minutes all alone with Sonny Ono, and Dragon can have his way with his former manager. Just one problem here though, Yuji Nagata's been on an impressive win streak as of late and he's going to be a tough man to beat tonight at World War 3. Dragon started off pretty well with a leg sweep, a snapmare and an elbow drop combo but his handspring back elbow gets countered and Nagata locks in an armbar. Dragon quickly gets out and Nagata leaves the ring after taking a drop kick. On the outside, Sonny Ono tried attacking the Dragon and that didn't go too well. Nagata saved Ono from getting dropped with a suplex but back in the ring, a side headlock takeover kept Dragon in control. The whole stead applied for an extended period of time but Nagata managed to get out by folding Ultimo Dragon up with a back suplex. Ultimo Dragon then got punished with a few kicks, Nagata delivers a pile driver and then the match slowed down again with a sleeper hold from Nagata. Just like the side headlock though, it gets broken up with a back suplex. We see another pile driver from Nagata, he performs a kick combo, he then locks in a camo clutch but Dragon won't give up. He then goes back to the sleeper hold and yeah, I'm starting to think this match maybe shouldn't have opened the pay per view after all. The Dragon Dragon kick combo puts Nagata down and Dragon just fucking drags his boot over Nagata's face. Dragon then performs a crossbody to the outside and back in the ring he performs a sunset flip powerbomb but Nagata kicks out at two. Ultimo Dragon keeps the pressure on with a moonsault, we then see the Dragon sleeper but Sonny Ono jumps on the apron as Nagata gives up. The referee of course doesn't see Nagata submit so Dragon sets Nagata up and we see the Dragon Steiner. That little shit Ono puts Nagata's foot on the rope though. Dragon not Knocks Ono off the apron by using Nagata as a battering ram, but Nagata falls on top of Dragon and the referee counts to four. I guess he was just making sure. Nagata wins and Dragon doesn't get his five minutes with his former manager. This one picked up considerably towards the end, but a lot of the match was spent in headlocks and sleeper holds. We have seen way better from both guys, so yeah, not a lot to see here unfortunately. The Steiners put their tag team titles on the line next against the Blue Bloods, Steve Regal and Dave Taylor. This match wasn't promoted at all on Nitro and even though the Blue Bloods got a big victory over Harlem Heat on Nitro, this one still felt very predictable. Dave Taylor was no match for Scotty Steiner as Scott performed a big hip toss followed by a double underhook slam and even though Regal was feeling pretty confident when he got tagged in, as you can see here, Big Rick Steiner kept everything under control, even beating Regal at his own game with some grounded submissions. Dave Taylor Taylor comes in and he takes the Rick Steiner scoop power slam that I could honestly watch over and over again. The Blue Bloods were then able to keep Scott in their corner though to build up to that Steiner hot tag and Rick of course cleaned house after getting tagged in. This one ended with a Steiner bulldog and the crowd enjoyed the match. It's a by the numbers Steiner brothers match though for sure which isn't a bad thing. After the bout JJ Dillon gets interviewed by Mean Gene Okerlund and Dillon lets us know that Raven's gonna wrestle next at World War 3, however Raven still hasn't signed his WC W contract. Dylan says enough's enough, Raven has to sign his WCW deal within 24 hours or he's out. He won't be allowed to sit in the audience anymore, he won't be allowed to show up to Nitro. If Raven doesn't sign then this next match, Raven vs Scotty Riggs, will be the last time we see Raven on a WCW show. So this one started a few weeks back when Riggs declined an invitation to join Raven's flock. Raven and Riggs had a match where a drop to a hold on a chair caused Scotty to lose sight in his right eye and since then Raven has still tried to get Scotty to join the flock but Riggs has continued to decline. Smackhead Kidman says Raven will only wrestle tonight if it's no disqualification, it has to be Raven's rules and Riggs agrees. This is exactly what happened when Scotty took the drop to a hold on Nitro by the way. Riggs starts it off by taking out Kidman, Raven and Saturn and Riggs stays on Raven back inside the ring. Parrot Riggs pummels Raven and Raven goes down after a swinging neckbreaker, though the offense stops when Raven throws Riggs into the corner. Bobby Heenan says Raven should just move the eye patch over to Scotty's good eye as Raven chokes Scotty with his flannel 
shirt. Raven then brings it to the outside, but it's Scotty who does all the damage. Raven gets thrown into the ring steps and Raven gets choked with a camera cord. Scotty gets in a few punches back inside the ropes, but a jawbreaker buys Raven a little more time. Saturn gives Raven a chair and Scotty takes a shot across the back. Raven then sets the chair up in the middle of the ring, but he gets a taste of his own medicine when Scotty performs a drop toe hold, the same move that made Scotty turn into a swashbuckling pirate. Still though, this doesn't end the match and Raven kicks out of the follow up cover. Riggs then drop kicks the chair into Raven's face, but again, the match isn't over, Raven gets a foot on the ropes. Riggs says that's enough, he performs a bulldog and Raven takes all the impact on the chair, but again, somehow Raven kicks out. Raven counters a suplex with the even flow DDT, Raven grabs a mic and he says he didn't want to do this, he wants Riggs to join him, he says he feels Scotty's pain after hitting him with another DDT, and Raven wants to know why Riggs won't listen to him as Riggs takes a third even flow. Scotty can't answer the 10 count and Raven wins via knockout. The flock enters the ring as Raven gets his hand raised and the flock carry Riggs out of the ring and through the crowd. Scotty could be heard whispering, thanks Raven. I like this match quite a bit, they told a good story here and I like how vicious Raven got towards the end of the bout. We have been seeing a lot of Raven and it's been a lot of talk with very little action. Tonight he showed why people should fear him and this is exactly what he needed to do at this point. Big Steve Mongo McMichael vs Bill Goldberg was our next scheduled match but the match doesn't take place. Mongo walks out holding a lead pipe and he's wearing the Super Bowl ring that his wife Deborah gave to Goldberg at Halloween Havoc, so it looks like Mongo already got to Goldberg. Mongo grabs a microphone and he says Goldberg isn't the only one who can sneak up on somebody, referring to Halloween Havoc. We go backstage and we see Goldberg having a little snooze, so yeah, the match isn't gonna happen. Steve says he's ready to wrestle though, there has to be someone backstage who wants to give these people in attendance a show. Who's it gonna be? Who's it gonna be? The only big Mongo around here is the one in Alex's pants. Oh, big bad ones. Maybe for the first time ever, Alex does not feel like dancing tonight as he gets dragged to the ring by Deborah. but then he remembers he's Alex fucking right and the people need Saturday Ride Fever. Alex beats the shit out of Mongo with his sick leather jacket right at the opening bell but Mongo's on fire tonight. A back elbow and a few clotheslines gets followed up with a body slam, Alex gets kicked out of the ring and Deborah has to convince Alex to get back inside the ropes and finish the job. Alex was clearly saving his energy for the big battle royal tonight, which he's gonna win by the way. Alex gets in a cheap shot but Mongo replies with a, a, an interesting flopjack I guess. Mongo performs a sidewalk slam, Alex answers with a jumping heel kick, but Steve's hard to beat tonight and Daz Wunderkin decides he's gonna let Steve win so he can focus on the World War 3 match, there's nothing to gain from beating Mongo. Steve hits a few 3 point stance tackles, another sidewalk slam, we see the Mongo spike and McMichael wins via pinfall. Bigger fish to fry for Alex Wright though, bigger fish to fry. All joking aside, this match wasn't good and Alex didn't get a chance to show off at all really, a big old waste of time. Rey Mysterio Jr defeated Eddie Guerrero at Halloween Havoc to win the Cruiserweight title, the match was insanely good. On Nitro though a few weeks later, Rey lost the title back to Eddie clean and this was kinda surprising. Dean Malenko showed up to confront Eddie, so it looks like the Cruiserweight title might move over to the never ending Guerrero vs Malenko feud, but tonight at World War 3, Rey has another chance to win the title. Eddie complains to Charles Robinson after Mysterio gets the better of Latino heat at the opening bell, a huge snapmare takeover sends Eddie flying out of the ring, and once again he complains to the referee but Ray's doing nothing wrong. All this is getting Eddie great heat and he covers his ears as the crowd chants Eddie sucks. Ray performs a head scissors takedown but Eddie moves into a head scissors submission. The two get back up and Guerrero drops Ray with a release German suplex and Mysterio goes down after a hard back suplex. Eddie then applies an abdominal stretch and there's a botch here when Ray comes running at Eddie but they recover well and Eddie goes out of the ring after a springboard head scissors takedown. Ray goes for a sunset flip powerbomb from the ring to the outside but he can't complete the move. Guerrero ends up hitting a backbreaker and yeah, something just feels a bit off here in comparison to the Halloween Havoc match. Guerrero delivers a superplex, he signals for the frog splash, Ray dodges it and Guerrero gets caught out with a hurricane rana, only scoring a two count. Ray's head scissor takedown also fails to put Eddie away, Eddie comes back with a front suplex on the top rope, Eddie then tries the sunset flip powerbomb but Ray counters with a hurricane rana and Mysterio follows this up with a somersault senton. Back in the ring, Eddie throws himself into the top turnbuckle 
table in ring post, but he grabs Ray and he performs a counter power bomb. We then see the gory special, but Ray counters it with a roll up, again, only scoring a two count. Ray goes upstairs, but Guerrero follows him. It looks like Eddie's going for a lagger bomb, but Ray tries to counter and it's another botch, unfortunately. Ray tries to make up for it with a moonsault and a springboard leg drop. He signals for the West Coast pop. Eddie takes the move, but he grabs the rope during the cover. Ray thought he got the three count for just a moment. The match comes to an end when Eddie drops Ray on the top rope. We then see the frog splash and Eddie beats Ray clean once again on TV. It's not a bad cruiserweight match, but when you compare it to Halloween Havoc, it's almost like watching two different wrestlers. There's a few slip-ups here from Ray, and you know, they don't call it high-risk offense for nothing. It's just a shame Ray had a run of bad luck in this match, really. Not awful, but you're better off sticking with Halloween Havoc. The Kurt Hennig vs Ric Flair rivalry continues on WCW. This is a rematch from Halloween Havoc and once again the US title's on the line. This whole thing stems from Fall Brawl and Flair seeking revenge for Kurt slamming that cage door on his head. Maybe the feud ends tonight at World War 3 in this no disqualification match. Rick has a little trouble getting his hands on the US champion with Kurt trying to stall as much as possible, but Flair remembers it's an ODQ match tonight so he attacks on the outside. Flair throws Kurt over the guardrail, the two fight in the crowd with Flair maintaining the advantage but losing it when the two come back to the guardrail. Kurt screams at Flair and he wraps a cord around the nature boy's neck. Rick gets tossed into the ring and again, perfect chokes Flair with that camera cord. The two end up on the outside again with Flair taking control. The nature boy performs a double axe handle from the top all the way down to the floor, but this move hurts Flair and he begins limping. The commentators wonder if Flair twisted his ankle. Kurt takes a few chops at the guardrail, but Hennig answers with a thumb to the eye. Gets him every time. Rick takes a few right hands before the match resumes back in the ring, and Randy Anderson gets fucking pie-faced by Kurt after Flair kicks out a two. We see a Kurt Hennig scissor stomp, and Kurt begins putting all his efforts into damaging the knee and leg. Hennig slaps the shit out of Rick when he applies a leg lock, but Rick replies with a punch to the face, and the move gets broken up. Flair then goes after Kurt's leg. With the former Mr. Perfect stunned, Flair's able to drop a knee and a few quick punches. Rick then goes upstairs and, as always, it doesn't pay off. Flair gets slammed to the mat, the nature boy gets right back up and he throws a few chops, but Kurt shows he's no slouch when it comes to chopping, and we see the Flair flop. A very back and forth match so far and it's hard to predict who's gonna win. Both men eventually run into each other and they take their time getting back to their feet. It's all back and forth action again when both guys do eventually get back up, with Flair once again taking chops in the corner. We see the Hennig snap mare and neck snap, Flair goes up and over the turnbuckles. The nature boy takes more punishment, we think Hennig Hennig's now in a position to end this one and Flair can't fight back, but Kurt gets thrown into the guardrail and the nature boy ain't done yet. He suplexes Kurt back into the ring and Rick then grabs the chair that Kurt Hennig brought to the ring. Hennig gets dropped on the top of the chair and Rick then kicks the chair, causing it to close around Kurt's leg. He does this twice and the spot looked brilliant. The crowd loved it and Kurt sells it like a champ. Rick then grabs another chair and the US belt. Kurt takes a shot to the knee. We then see the figure four, but Kurt's able to grab the US title and he cracks it over Flair's knee and his head. Hennig covers Flair and Kurt Hennig wins the match. Remember what I said on Reliving the War about Kurt's matches being more suited for pay-per-view and not so much weekly Nitro episodes? This is proof right here. It wasn't a classic or anything, but it was pretty good. Definitely my favourite Kurt Hennig match in WCW so far. Both guys are hurt leaving the match, but both guys are also scheduled to take part in our main event. The World War 3 Battle Royal is up next. Sting vs Hollywood Hogan's already booked for Starcade. that match is set in stone. The winner of the World War 60 man battle royal will get a title shot at Super Brawl 8, or at least that's the plan at the moment. Michael Buffer runs down the rules, 3 rings, 60 wrestlers, wrestlers can move from one ring to the other, if your feet touch the floor you're out of the match, so there's no over the top rope rule this year. The match continues until there's 5 wrestlers in each ring and then all 15 men have to fight it out in inside ring number 2, the centre ring. The last man standing in ring 2 will be declared the winner of World War 3. So here we go, I'm not going to be able to cover every elimination here and trying to watch World War 3 is bad enough, never mind talking about what happens moment for moment, but we'll talk about a few eliminations before the final 15. We've got DDP, Big Bubba, there's Alex Wright, my choice to win this thing, uh, Benoit, Finlay, Ultimo Dragon, Luis Piccoli, last year's winner The Giant, 
Chris Jericho's here, Harlem Heat, Hacksaw Jim Duggan's in the match, Lucha Cowboy Silver King, Barry Dorso, oh shit there's El Dandy, actually El Dandy's my choice to win this thing, uh, there's Glacier, fuck him, all the WCW guys come out and then the NWO's music plays, the faction walk out together and they show a little love to Six. Six, of course, is no longer in WCW. The commentators notice that only 59 guys have came down to the ring. The NWO are one man short. Kevin Nash said on Nitro that he'd be here and Nash hasn't made his entrance, so nobody knows what's going on. The match is going to begin with 59 men, the bell rings and the giant eliminates 6 guys including Disco Inferno, The Vianos and Luis Piccoli, Norman Smiley gets eliminated, Ming eliminates both members of Public Enemy and it looks like the NWO are going to stick to ring number 1 and the faction are going to work together, Scott Hall eliminates El Dandy for fucks sake but Alex Wright's still in there, I think he's in ring number 3 completely owning it, ring 2's absolutely packed with guys and it looks like no one's been eliminated there at all. The commentators then get confused about what ring they are looking at but this thing's already a giant clusterfuck so it doesn't really matter. Booker T eliminates Silver King from ring 2, we see an aerial shot and I can see Alex Wright still in there, good man. DDP eliminates Prince Ikea and Yuji Nagata, we have stayed on ring 2 for ages now and I want to see what the NWO are up to, oh sweet I'll just watch ring 1 on this tiny fucking screen. Dave Taylor tries to eliminate Alex Wright but Des Wunderkind stays in the match, ring 3 has very little people left at this point and it looks like the giant's hand injury is giving him a bit of trouble. Five guys are left in ring 2 and ring 3 so they wait for the numbers to go down in ring 1. Kurt Hennig kicks Rey Mysterio out of the ring but Mysterio holds on to the apron, we assume he still gets eliminated because we don't see him again during the match. The rule book then gets fucked out the window and the guys in ring 3 start fighting each other, Ming eliminates Mongo, Mortis and Alex then team up to eliminate the giant but it backfires and my pick to win this thing gets dumped out of the the ring. The giant then eliminates Ming, so yeah they fucked this up, 5 NWO guys in ring 1, 4 WCW guys in ring 2 and 1 guy in ring number 3, the giant. The NWO aren't leaving ring number 1, the giant joins the WCW guys in ring number 2 and the WCW guys end up jumping over to ring 1 and that's where the match is gonna end. Vincent gets eliminated first, Booker T and Rick Steiner then get dumped out rather quickly, the NWO get together to eliminate Lex Luger but the giant runs over and Buff Bagwell gets eliminated, Kurt Hennig and Lex Luger follow shortly thereafter. So we have our final four, DDP, Scott Hall, Randy Savage and the giant. The giant stops Macho Man from hitting the elbow drop on Paige and Paige is able to hit a diamond cutter on Randy Savage. The giant stops Macho from getting eliminated though because the big man wanted to choke slam Savage. Savage takes the move and then he gets stumped out of the ring. So Scott Hall is now all alone with two WCW guys. Scott goes over to ring number 2, he then points at the entrance way, the NWO's music begins to play and number 60 is gonna make his way down to the ring. The NWO music then stops, Voodoo Child plays in the arena and out walks WCW champion Hollywood Hogan. The commentators can't believe it but Hogan's part of this match and he joins Scott Hall in World War 3. It's two NWO guys once again versus two WCW guys. The four men start fighting and Hogan body slams the giant, this makes the crowd pop. The fresh Hogan then goes to work on DDP as the giant takes care of Hall. The crowd then pop again as a shit sting descends from the rafters and it's clear as day who this is. He steps over the top rope as Hogan dumps DDP out of the ring. Hogan then eliminates himself when he sees the shit sting. The commentators are totally insulting everyone's intelligence by acting like this is the real sting as the giant gets clobbered with the baseball bat. And he falls out of the ring and that's it over, Scott Hall wins World War 3 and Scott Hall gets the title shot next year. The massive fake sting gets in the ring, he points the baseball bat at Scott Hall, he then takes his mask off and of course it's Kevin Nash. The NWO come to the ring to celebrate with Hall, Eric Bischoff's even smoking a cigar. DDP gets brought back inside the ropes and Hogan hits him with a diamond cutter. And that's it over, the credits roll and World War 3 1997's in the books. 
So the pay-per-view as a whole doesn't come recommended, unfortunately, and there's nothing here at all that's must-see. Raven vs Riggs and Hennig vs Flair were matches I enjoyed, and I didn't think Disco vs Saturn was all that bad either, but there's much better matches to be found on other WCW pay-per-views in 1997. It's a very average pay-per-view, and it even feels like winning the Battle Royal doesn't mean all that much, seeing as the title shot isn't until next year. This pay-per-view feels more like an annoyance for WCW on the road to Starcade. It's just okay, but those people who decided not to buy the show on pay-per-view definitely made the right call. But our next WCW pay-per-view in the Reliving the War timeline is definitely a big one. Some say it is the beginning of the end, but it's still significant. We'll get to Starcade 1997 in just a few short weeks, so join me on Reliving the War, and we'll see how WCW gets to their biggest, most financially successful pay-per-view of all time. Thanks for watching guys, I do appreciate it, and take care. Yeah. Let me explain, cause how to make greatness straight out the gate, I'm about to break you down. Ain't no mistakes allowed, but make no mistake, I'm about to rape the alphabet. I make plays some browse. If I press the issue just to get the anchor out, put a full magazine can take staples out. Savage, but ain't thinking about the bank account. But bitch, I'm off the chain like Kayla Brown. Motherfucker, shut the fuck up when you're talking, little bitch. I'm sorry, wait, what's your talent? Oh, see, my talent. Oh, bitch, I don't know. We will fuck y'all on and give a so far far, or even have an opinion if you. You mention me, millions of views, attention and news. I mention you, lose, lose for me, win, win for you. Billions of views, your ten cents are through. Skim through the music to get shit reviews. To get clicks, the bitch, you just lit the fuse. Don't get misconstrued, business is used, shitless renewed. Don't get shit to do, or get this, cause I just don't get what the fuck half the shit is that you're listening to. Do you have any idea how much I hate this choppy flow? Everyone copies, though, probably no. Get this fucking audio out my audio, audio. So I can see why people like little Yachty, but not me, though. Not even this, and it just ain't for me. All I am simply is just an MC. Maybe Stan just isn't your cup of tea. Maybe